Great. Well, uh, thanks so much for inviting me. It's great to be able to talk to uh, a different audience uh, about this, uh, this work. Uh, and also, uh, really, I'm really very excited to hear people from, working from different disciplines that are talking about work that's work from a very different perspective and, and thinking about how to measure well-being, thinking about what we should do with well-being. Uh, so I'm really excited to have the opportunity to speak with you but also to hear everything else that is coming uh, for the rest of this meeting. Uh, so again, what I'm going to be talking about is how to measure happiness. And I'll start out by talking about what I mean by happiness. And I will say uh, at the outset that I'm talking about happiness very loosely. And then actually, usually in our work, uh, I talk about it more precisely as subjective well-being. And I know that these two are not exactly the same thing. So uh, I'll, I'll really focus on subjective well-being. And to start out, I'll define what I mean by subjective well-being. It'll guide what I'm going to focus on in terms of the measurement of this construct. So typically when I talk about subjective well-being, what I focus on is this overarching evaluation of the quality of a person's life from his or her own perspective. So the idea is that it captures many different aspects of people's lives, it allows them to weight those different aspects the way that they want to, and it acknowledges that different things might affect different people in different ways. And so a lot of people who work on the topic of subjective well-being focus on subjective self-reports of well-being, and then of course there are questions about uh, how those measures actually work, whether they do what they want them to do, whether there are certain types of problems that will come up when we use these types of measures. Now, uh, here's a nice quote that I think captures a lot of the assumptions that go into these self-reports of subjective well-being. Uh, this is from Campbell in 1981, who says that the use of these measures is based on the assumption that all the countless experiences that people go through from day to day add to global feelings of well-being, that these feelings remain relatively constant over extended periods and that people can describe them with candor and accuracy. Now, much of the research that we've done on the measurement of subjective well-being has really looked to see whether the measures themselves actually are consistent with this idea that these, fe that these features of people's lives are somehow related to the reports that they give us, that these reports are stable over time, and that they're not uh, affected by things that we don't want them to be affected by. And so, of course, it becomes a problem when research suggests that simple things like finding a dime on the ground can actually change people's well-being, this thing that is supposed to be very stable over time from moment to moment. And so there have been a lot of, uh, uh, there's been a lot of attention to studies that have, that have highlighted these ways that subjective well-being measures don't seem to behave the way that we would like them to when we do different types of studies. Now, a lot of these criticisms can be captured by what is called the judgment model, or uh, one set of researchers is the judgment model, captured by the judgment model of subjective well-being. And the people who work in this judgment model suggest that there are some concerns that we should, be, that we should have about these measures. Uh, first, if we think of the typical type of measure that we might have of a subjective well-being, let's say an overall measure of life satisfaction, where we ask people on a scale from 0 to 10, how satisfied are you with life as a whole, this requires people to do quite a bit. So for instance, they need to think about all the different life domains that exist. They have to think about how important those different domains are for themselves. They have to then aggregate across many of this, those different types of domains. And researchers from the judgment model have pointed out that this task is actually relatively difficult. Simply remembering uh, and bringing to mind all these different dimensions is, is difficult. Uh, aggregating them might not happen in the same way across different individuals. Uh, and also the fact that most people make these judgments within seconds suggests that they are probably not going through a detailed search of their memory considering all of these different aspects when they come up with that judgment. So because of this, researchers from this tradition have suggested, people rely on what is currently on their mind. So that might be domains that happen to be salient, something that came to mind before you were asked the question. Uh, salient comparison standards, people that you might be thinking about when you compare yourselves to make this judgment, or even mood at the time may influence the reports that we provide. And so the result, according to these researchers, is uh, profound context effects that reduce the reliability and the validity of well-being measures. And indeed, much of the research has been summarized in a chapter by Schwartz and Strack, now a relatively old chapter, but one that was very influential, where they concluded that there is little to be learned from global self-reports of well-being what is being assessed and how seems too context dependent to provide reliable information about a population's well-being. And these, this conclusion came from this review 
where they pointed out, again, that people's life satisfaction seems dramatically higher when the weather is nice than when the weather is bad, uh, after someone has found a dime on the floor or a copy machine, after your favorite soccer team has won a game versus tied a game. All of these types of uh, effects add up to this conclusion that perhaps we shouldn't be using these global well-being measures, ones that ask people to evaluate their life as a whole. So because of that, people have suggested that maybe we should move away from these global reports that ask people to reflect on their lives as a whole and move to experiential measures that take a lot of the work out of the hands of the respondent himself or herself. So the idea is rather than asking people to aggregate across many different domains of their lives, many different moments of their lives, what we can do is assess those moments themselves. We can give people an app on their phone, signals them many times a day, and says simply, how are you feeling at this moment? We can then track what they're doing at that moment, how they're feeling at that moment, and we do the aggregation for them. We sum all these up to get a sense about how their life is going as a whole. So we were measuring people's experience rather than their global judgments to get a sense of what their well-being actually looks like. Now what I'm going to do in today's talk is to do two things. Uh, one, to reevaluate the judgment model of subjective well-being. Because even though I think the ideas are compelling and the studies are elegant, I think we should have concerns about the quality of the evidence that has led to the conclusions about the problematic status of global reports of well-being. And then what I'll do is flip this around and suggest that we haven't been critical enough about the experiential measures that have been proposed as a replacement for these global assessments. So, why am I concerned about the evidence that's come from the judgment model? Well, part of it has to do with this concern about replicability that has gotten a lot more attention within the field of psychology, and then I think also in broader fields of science more generally. And that is that I think a lot of these study, a lot of the studies that have received an incredible amount of attention, have been incredibly influential with the field, simply don't hold up when we evaluate them from modern standards of evidence. So if we look at these studies, really, if we, I've, and I've tried to be as comprehensive as I can in evaluating the evidence for these judgment models of subjective well-being. And what I tend to find when I look at these studies is a couple of characteristics that concern me. One is that these studies typically have implausibly large effect sizes. Uh, the impact that these supposedly inconsequential factors have on subjective well-being, they are concerning, but actually they seem to be too large in the studies, given what we know about the components that are building up to these studies. Second, there's a hallmark of problematic and unreplicable research that we typically find in research from the judgment model, and that is that the analyses that we conduct, even if the study has a very, very similar design, the analyses actually change in ways that suggest that they have been used somewhat flexibly. This means that this might be more likely that we pick the analysis that gets the effect in those studies rather than using a consistent effect across all studies. Another one that I assume the people outside of psychology are even more concerned about than I am, which is that these studies typically have extremely small sample sizes. So often when we compare two groups of people to get these uh, important findings, a lot of times those the, the groups themselves only have 10, 12, 15 people in them. Uh, and we can be concerned about that. And then finally, there are few, if any, direct replications of the studies that have become so famous, that have become so influential over time. So what we can do is actually go back and look in some detail at some of these studies to see how convincing we find the evidence when we really pay attention to that evidence. So as I said at the beginning of my talk, one idea that seems to have gotten a lot of attention is the fact that simply finding a dime cannot influence your well-being. This comes from a very famous study published in Norbert Schwartz's dissertation, and so it was never actually published uh, in a journal, and then in a peer-reviewed journal, it was published in a dissertation. Uh, where, again, it was a very elegant study, a very uh, attention-grabbing study, where uh, people were asked to fill out a, a global report of well-being, a measure of life satisfaction. Uh, but, being a social psychological study, there was a cute feature to it. Uh, the experimenter ran out of uh, um, questionnaires, and so the participant was asked to go to the copy machine and copy the questionnaire so they could finish the study. When the participant got to that copy machine, either there was a dime on the copy machine or there was not. Finding the dime was supposed to be a little bit of a boost of positive emotions, and the positive emotions were then supposed to, supposed to influence people's life satisfaction judgments, which is what happened uh, in the studies. Those who found the dime reported higher life satisfaction than those who did not find the dime. 
Now this finding, although it was never published in the peer-reviewed article, has been extremely influential. Almost every meeting I go on the measurement of well-being, this study is cited. I've heard two Nobel Prize winners talk about this study as a reason why we should not be why we should be concerned about the measurement of subjective well-being. But if we look at the details, we find there are implausibly large differences. Uh, so it turns out that actually the evidence for the effect of getting a little finding a dime or something like that on mood is relatively uh, um, uh, questionable. But in addition, the differences uh, between the two groups in this study were actually about a standard uh, mean difference of one uh, 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 between the two groups, which seems very large to me. Uh, actually, though, if you look at the details of the study, they were not even significant uh, in the study. So again, this study was influential, uh, and the total end was just 16, so eight people per group, not significant differences, and plausibly large effects, yet this is influencing our policies about how we use uh, subjective well-being measures. Another study that has been even more influential uh, is the weather study. And so um, uh, in this study, which is one of the most highly cited studies in social psychology, what the researchers did, and this is the story that you hear about this, is the researchers contacted people on a very nice day or a very uh, bad weather day and assessed their level of life satisfaction. And again, those who were assessed on the positive day reported higher life satisfaction than those who reported on the cold and rainy day. Importantly, this was done in Illinois in the Midwest of the United States on the, supposedly the part of the story is that this was done on the very, very first warm spring sunny day to emphasize that, that weather really matters uh, and with that relief that we feel when spring is finally here is supposed to be a contributing factor to this effect. Now, it turns out that actually the study was more complicated than that. There were six different cells in the design uh, because the researchers not only wanted to show that weather matters, but they wanted to show that they could wipe out that effect by drawing people's attention to the weather before they made the judgment. The idea being that if you draw people's attention to the fact that weather is influencing your mood, you will then discount that effect and you will wipe out the effect and so life satisfaction will not be influenced by weather in those situations. But what I wanted to point out is that the effect is actually being driven simply by one cell with about 16 people in it. The other five conditions were not different from one another. And what I've done here, just to really uh, try to emphasize the difference in these results, is to give you what the uh, uh, distribution of life satisfaction scores from national representative data in the US to show you what a typical distribution looks like. I wanted to highlight that five of the cells, those in the green lines, were not different from one another. They do bounce around, the sample sizes are very small, and the entire effect was being driven by one cell, which is not in the, uh, the warm uh, sunny day condition, but actually the cold normal uh, spring day, where life satisfaction scores were very, very low, um, probably about what you'd expect of people who are diagnosed as being clinically depressed or in other bad, very bad circumstances. So again, small sample sizes, in my sense, is this is an implausibly large effect. Now, we've actually, in the past five to ten years, tried to replicate a lot of the findings from this judgment model, and have actually not been successful in doing so. The first way we did this is we took data from the United States. Uh, this is a, uh, from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey, which is a collection of uh, surveys that are run every year. It's organized by the Center for Disease Control in the United States. Uh, this is an extremely large sample size, so we had about 2 million people at the beginning of the study. We did cut it down a little bit because we looked at different metro areas in the United States. This is actually a map of well-being in different areas in the United States. We were less interested in these geographical differences than in what happens as uh, uh, the weather changes across the because we know when these surveys were taken, we know where people were, where they took them, and so what we could do is over the course of four years, uh, surveys conducted throughout the year, we were able to link these data to the weather conditions at the time that the survey took place. And what we found is that across those four years, across the entire country, that there was no impact whatsoever of weather on the life satisfaction that people reported. Uh, we did all kinds of analyses comparing what the weather typically was to the weather that day, what the weather was yesterday, uh, rain, sun, all these types of things, we never found any effect whatsoever with a sample size over a million uh, in doing this. Uh, to give you one example, I'm going to show you the effects of cloud cover. We did actually did much more sophisticated analyses than what I'm going to present up here. 
All I'm going to show you are the means for the life satisfaction measure that they had in different days. The scale for cloud cover that, that the meteorologists report goes from zero to eight, with zero being a perfectly sunny day and eight being a perfectly uh, as cloudy as it gets. I will show you the means for the life satisfaction measure across those days. I will also show you a red line and a green line that show you how big the effect would need to be to get close to what they found in the original study. And it looks something like this. So these are the differences that we found from zero to eight. Absolutely no difference in life satisfaction across those conditions. And this is the difference we would have had to find between the green and the red line to replicate something the same size of the effect from the original study. Uh, there are error bars on this, but the sample sizes are large enough that most of you probably can't see them, uh, which I think is relatively strong evidence that this effect is not especially robust. Other people have also attempted this. Uh, some of those seem like they provide more evidence than others, but I think uh, I can talk about the complexities of those studies afterwards if you want. My reading is that there's very little evidence of whether it affects life satisfaction, and in fact, there's surprisingly little evidence that weather even affects mood, which I think most people find relatively shocking. We also have done a number of direct replications of the original studies. This is a complicated graph. Uh, you don't have to look at the details. Uh, it's a forest plot from a meta-analysis that we did showing the original studies, as many of them as we could use to come up with effect sizes. Those are at the top part. Uh, many of those studies did not report enough details for us to calculate effect sizes. Those weren't included in the meta-analyses. Uh, but what you can see is those studies that have typically been done have led to standardized mean differences of about one, which is a really large effect. We have also attempted to replicate as many of those studies with much larger sample sizes. Most of our replication attempts themselves were conducted multiple times. Those are the bottom parts. And we had an average mean difference of 0.08, which was not significant and very different from those original studies. Uh, including studies where we did uh, weather studies where we tried to contact people on that first warm spring day in the Midwest and did not get effects there. So what can we conclude about these types of mood studies? Well, I think we should have strong concerns about the size and the robustness of these very influential, very famous studies looking at the effects of context on well-being judgments. What we typically find is that our studies that use natural mood inductions tend to fail to replicate the original effects. And in addition, when we do go into the laboratory and try to replicate as precisely as possible the conditions of the original studies, those effect sizes are much smaller than in the original studies. And when we look specifically at why these effects fail to replicate, I think there are two features that contribute. First, when we look at the naturally occurring ones, these naturally occurring mood inductions are not robust. So as I said, weather doesn't seem to impact mood as much as we would think. Finding a dime or a quarter now, if we actually did this study where we adjusted for inflation and used a quarter, um, these don't seem to impact the mood very much either. But even when we do go into the lab and reliably affect the mood that our participants are experiencing, then the effects of that mood on the life satisfaction judgments tend to also be relatively small, much smaller than the original ones. This leads to questions about whether these effects are so profound after all. Okay, so let's move to the alternative then. So because of the concerns about global measures, people have suggested that we should be focusing more on experiential measures, the ones that do the work for the participants, where we simply assess them many, many different times, and then try to aggregate them ourselves to build up to this experience of what people's lives are like as a whole. Some benefits that have been pro proposed for these experiential measures are that they don't rely on memory. I don't need to know what I was actually feeling uh, or experiencing a week ago or a month ago or a year ago. They don't require any aggregation. We don't need to add up to figure out whether some moments are, uh, whether uh, we include all these different moments or different life domains. And there is some research that suggests that by focusing on something narrow and concrete, that all those context effects that were proposed won't have as big of an effect as they would for global judgments that are vaguer and allow for these contextual factors to play a bigger role. But there are also problems, and I think people have not been skeptical enough about the experiential measures themselves. Uh, so I think that these benefits, which are so obvious and so clear compared to the global judgments, have led people to adopt these measures without really asking questions about validity, asking questions about whether they have their own unique problems that affect 
the extent to which they really do what we want them to do. And there is one problem that I think actually emerges from a related literature to the context effects on global well-being judgments that should make us somewhat concerned. And that is, every time we ask a participant to report an answer to some sort of question, even though we might think that the question itself is relatively simple, the question actually influences what people are doing when they are responding to it. The way that we ask that question shapes the answer the participants provide. So participants, when they receive that question, they make inferences about the questioner's intent. So for instance, in one study from the same group of researchers who did these other studies that I've been critical of, these studies I really like, I think that they're a little bit more robust, uh, we actually find two subtly different questions might be interpreted very differently if presented one after, after one another in a questionnaire. So for instance, there's a study that shows that if you ask a happiness question, and then immediately ask people a satisfa life satisfaction question, that those questions are correlated less strongly than if we separated them by presenting them as two, two, different, uh, measure, uh, two different questionnaires. So when we communicate to someone that this is a completely different questionnaire, so it makes sense that I might be asking the same question twice, they give us the same answer. If I include them on the same questionnaire, they say, why would he be asking me the same question twice? I'm going to give you a different answer for the second question. They interpret it slightly differently. But what happens if we start doing that in the context of an experience sampling study? where we're beeping people 10 times a day, and we ask that question to them at 11 a.m. and then at 1 p.m., participants might assume that we want to emphasize the things that have changed from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. They might then emphasize the difference rather than the similarity when they're providing responses to that question. So the question we ask is whether the same exact question can be interpreted differently depending on the context, for instance, in these intensive repeated measures designs. Now, when I started thinking about this question, I started to think about a line of research that I had conducted with a graduate student that was actually not on well-being, but was related to this exact issue. And this was actually in relation to assessing personality in different contexts. So I'm a personality psychologist. Personality psychologists study personality traits. Some researchers were interested in the way that personality traits change in different contexts. And so they would often ask people, how extroverted are you when you're with your friends? How extroverted are you when you're a worker? How extroverted are you when you're with a family member? And they found that there was variability in those reports, and people thought that the variability itself might be important. We were concerned, however, that by asking those types of questions, we actually pull from more variability in the responses that people provide to us. Now, testing that's kind of challenging because we need to know whether asking them this question makes them more variable, but to assess that variability, you have to ask that question multiple times. So what we did was, was to come up with a design that looked like this. For all participants in our study, we asked them what they were like in general online before they came to the study. So uh, weeks before they came in, we said, fill out the standard personality questionnaire about what you were like in general. And then we had people come into the lab a couple weeks later, and we, gave, put them in, we had assigned them to one of two conditions. One, where they were asked to report what their personality was like in a specific role. What are you like as a friend? Or what are you like as a family member? The second group was asked to respond to a typical multiple role question, personality questionnaire, where they assessed all their personality in all different roles, with the assumption that that would prompt them to report more variability across those roles than they normally would. What we could then do is compare people, their role-specific ratings, uh, to their global personality rating across these two different conditions. And if asking people to report about their personality in multiple roles makes them change their answers, then the discrepancies in this multiple role condition will be larger than they were in the single role condition. And that's exactly what we found. Now, explaining the metric of these discrepancy scores is a little bit tricky because we are computing differences and then averaging those differences. But I can say that these are standard deviation units in the original, uh, from the original scale. And what we typically find is that those in the multiple role condition across two different studies report bit bigger discrepancies between any specific role and what they're like in general when they're asked to report about that specific role in the context of a multiple role questionnaire. In addition, the correlation between that role-specific rating and their general rating, what they're like in general, was higher when they were only asked one role than when they were asked multiple. So simply asking what they were like as a friend, as a family member, as a worker, as a student, 
cause them to exaggerate the differences relative to if I would just ask them, what are you like as a friend? When we do that single role, they just pretty much give us the same answer that they do when we ask them, what are you like in general? So the implications of this is that asking questions multiple times causes increased variability. In addition, asking questions multiple times increases the effect of the situation on the response that people give us. This seems to be due to conversational norms uh, where people assume that we want people to give, or we want to give people different answers. Now, one question we also asked about this is whether or not there are individual differences in this tendency to do this. And again, I'm going to present kind of a cute study that I'm a little bit embarrassed, but actually I think demonstrates this quite, rel quite relatively well. Um, so what we typically find is that those people who report the variability across these different roles in their personality, some people report more variability, some people report less, those people who do that also seem to report more variability in what their friend's personality is like across roles. That seems concerning to us. We didn't think there should be similarity in that way, but we can't rule out the possibility that people find friends who are, more ver who are as variable as they are. So what we had people do is rate something that didn't vary, and specifically we had them rate fictional characteristics, personality of fictional characteristics, to assess whether or not the variability across the fictional character characters uh, was related to people's own reports of variability. And specifically, we had them rate four characters from The Simpsons. We then kept, uh, so what is the personality of Homer Simpson? What is the personality of Bart Simpson? We then calculated a variability index across those ratings and compared it to the variability of a person's own personality across role. If we find correlations there, that should be concerning. We also came up with an alternative metric where we had people rate uh, neutral objects, again, and then calculated variability across these. And what we found is that people's own cross-world variability, how they vary from situation to situation, correlated with variability across the Simpsons characters, it correlated with variability across these neutral objects. Perhaps more importantly, when we actually used experiential measures to assess how their personality reports change over time, or their positive and negative affect over time, variability in those measures also correlated with these measures that we thought were capturing this probably response style, response style type of uh, individual difference. Now the reason that I think that this is important um, is because when we look at the typical pattern of results that emerges when we compare different types of well-being measures, there is a consistent pattern that seems to emerge. Global measures correlate more, correlate more strongly than experiential measures with life circumstances, your income, your marital status, uh, um, your, uh, your employment status, than do, uh, some compared to experiential measures. And experiential measures correlate more strongly with the experiences of people reporting with those same measures. And a lot of researchers have used that evidence to say, actually, those life circumstances don't matter. And really, it's just the experiences that we have from moment to moment. But if it's the case that these experiential measures actually prompt people to think about how those experiences are influencing them, that this might be due to the same type of focusing effect or because these measures are assessed in the same exact way at the same time, they could actually be due to shared method variants. So I think that what we really need to do is to come up with, sorry, I'm going to skip over that one, is to come up with some other way of assessing the validity of these two different types of measures and compare these two different validities. Validity. We don't have a gold standard measure for people's subjective well-being, so this can be a challenging We've made some initial efforts in this way by actually looking at the effect, uh, looking at the correlation between different types of self-reported well-being measures and comparing them to informant reports, assuming that people know about our, our, our close family members and friends, know about our well-being, they can provide reports on them. And what we found is that global reports of positive and negative affect tend to correlate more strongly with, self or with informant reports of life satisfaction than do day reconstruction method measures of well-being, experience sampling measures of well-being, the types of experiential measures that people are typically using now in their studies as an alternative to global reports. So what can we conclude about from this research, what I want to convey to you about global reports and experiential measures? First, I wanted to point out that there are many, many intuitive reasons for questioning global reports. 
And I think that a lot of those are valid concerns. I don't want to suggest to you that I think that there aren't problems with global reports uh, of subjective well-being. There are many others that we should be concerned about beyond what I've reported here. These concerns, however, have been supported by really eye-catching studies that are very salient, that many people, even outside the field of subjective well-being, have heard of. And if we actually look at those eye-catching studies, the evidence is actually not very strong. Experiential measures have been proposed as an alternative that can solve some of these obvious problems. And this, in fact, they, are so, they so clearly do solve these problems of memory and aggregation that sometimes people don't stop to think about whether there are unique concerns about these measures. So sometimes the face validity of experiential measures is so great, so clear, that people don't stop to think about whether there are additional concerns that might affect the validity of these alternative measures. So as I suggested here, perhaps these measures have their own unique concerns that we should be focused, focusing on. They might have their own unique problems that we should be highlighting. And in fact, when you look back, people have adopted these experiential measures. They are now in the German Socioeconomic Panel Study, the American Time Use Survey. All of these studies have adopted experiential measures. And honestly, there isn't that much evidence or the validity of these studies, even though they are much more time consuming, much more expensive than simply asking people on the zero to 10 scale how satisfied are you with your life. So I think that what I'm suggesting is that both of these are, have potential, but we need a lot more validation work for both types of measures before we shift our, our beliefs about what is a real effect to those that have used experiential measures. I'll stop there.